anybody else coming late, then uh, we shouldn't be late. Right, so I'm Greg, uh, co-founder at undo.io, and we're going to talk about debug info and elf and dwarf and all of that. I notice we're in the, obviously in the really serious room where we sat down with notes and, and this is like deep thinking. Um, so yeah, no pressure. Um, first thing I'd say is I would not count myself as an expert on this. I maybe know enough to be dangerous. Uh, I dare say there's people in the room who know there's just lots of it, right? It's like fractal. You can just keep getting into it. So I, I, th I always prefer these talks when they're the more kind of interactive they are, the better. So if anybody has, you know, comments, want to correct me if I'm wrong, want to add something at any point or just ask something, please just, uh, please just, just speak. It's a pretty small room. I think we can all hear, hear each other. Um, right, so when you do a conference talk, oh, I think that's what, so I'm just curious, I've always wanted to ask this, who reads the abstract in detail before deciding which talks to come to and who just kind of, versus just kind of look at the title like I do? Okay, about uh, half and half, maybe? There's like some shy, maybe read the abstract a bit, glance at it. Yeah, I always intend to, never quite get, uh, never quite get around to it. So anyway, when you do one of these talks, you write an abstract, and then you wait for ages, and then they tell you whether you've been accepted or not, and then in this case, yes, great, better do the talk, uh, look back at the abstract, see what I said I was going to say, and there are bugs in the abstract. Never mind. Um, so, most of you have read this already, so I won't uh, read it all out, but Okay, debug info is important for these tools like uh, debuggers and Valgrind and sanitizers and strace and ltrace and time travel debuggers. Well, strace doesn't use debug info, right? If you think about it, it's just, if you're familiar with strace, it's just giving you the system call. So that's wrong. Um, and then we talk about split dwarf um, and why we might want to do that. And it's a bit quicker loading and that's also wrong. Actually, I then found out that strace isn't as wrong as I thought it was because you can pass dash k to strace to get a backtrace and that will do some kind of looking up of symbols and things, but not really much in the debug info. Split dwarf for quicker loading is definitely wrong. We'll come to that. Anyway, uh, let's start at the beginning, right? Let's start at the beginning. What does dash g mean? I mean we all know, I think everybody when, um, knows what dash g does, right? As in what it gives you, why you would use it. But what does it actually do? Um, so let's start with, we, we, we uh, compile our program um, and uh, it gives us an a.out. An a.out is an elf file. Seems like everything is gonna become an elf file eventually. Um, like the kernel is an elf file, executables are elf file, .o files, libraries, everything is just an elf file. Uh, and an elf file has a bunch of sections of binary data and uh, I've simplified it. This is a simplified model of what you would need. If you're going to write the simplest possible executable, I think you would want all of these things. And then this, we'll see in a minute, there's all kinds of extra stuff. Uh, they, they're labeled so dot .text. That's where the code lives. I don't really know why. The, I mean, this is really historical, right? Going back to the very first Unix implementations. And why was it text rather than code? Well, maybe, they would, maybe it was really prescient and they saw that VS Code was going to come along and just completely own the word code in some sort of major arrogant uh, Microsoft way and so they made way for it. Um, dot data, um, so that's, uh, that's not where all the data is, but that's where your non-zero initialized read-write data will live. Uh, Read-only read data, so largely strings, but can be anything const and this kind of symbol table stuff so that we can relocate things. There's a lot more to it than that, and we'll get into some of it um, as we go in, but that's kind of the simple model. Um, and then if I add dash g, uh, then it will add this debug info uh, section, which contains everything that the debugger needs to kind of essentially decompile the program back to its original kind of, so it can look at what type, look at types and see where you are in the code and everything. It doesn't contain the source code, it just contains the kind of the, 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 the data structures that are need to map it back and it tells it where the source code lives. Okay, so what happens when we, uh, when we run this program? Uh, so well, it's, it's a, when we run, it's a file that lives on disk, right? It's an L file. Um, these three sections, these top three sections get M mapped into the address space of the program, right? And it is just like a regular M map. 
So the so it'll demand page in as it you know as it needs stuff. So you don't pay a penalty while the program's starting up if you've got lots of data that doesn't get touched. It will never get paged in, never get paged in. But anyway, so it's a regular demand mmap thing, and they can have different protections. That's why we have them. It's kind of the main reason why they live in different sections here, right? So our text, well, it better have execute permission, um, and it probably needs read permission. Maybe the theory might not have, but in practice it does. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't have write permissions because that obviously makes it for a bit of a security vulnerability. Um, our data, read write data, that clearly needs to be writable and readable, but not executable. And read only data, well, that might as well be read only. Um, also, here will be a stack and other things. Hopefully the stack is not executable, although in some cases it will be. Um, but that's pretty obviously a bad idea if you can avoid it. Anyway, so that's kind of conceptually uh, what happens. And the debugger comes along, GDB in this case, and it's going to read the memory of the running process, right? Most of this stuff is going to just slurp out of the running process using ptrace. It's also going to, re it's also going to refer to uh, the source code that's living somewhere on the file system that obviously doesn't live inside the address space of the program. Um, and uh, apologies at the back if this is the bottom of this is not readable, but anyway. Um, and uh, it's also going to read debug info and some sim symbol information out of the ELF file on disk to do what it needs to do. And that's basically how the debugger works, what it's looking at. That's the kind of conceptual model. So let's look at this maybe in a bit more uh, detail. Um, so, so uh, what I'm going to do actually, I'm just going to slightly uh, reduce the height of this window to make it more readable from the back. Okay. Uh, so let's, I want to run, I'm going to, for this demo, I want something that's kind of long running. So I've got this sleep program and uh, that's just going to run forever. So if I look at, oh, why have I got something? Hang on, that's going to confuse things. Let me, sorry, let's get rid of that. Right, so if I uh, want to look at that, uh, it's maps. Right. No, let's run. So let's do read elf first of all. Sorry. So read elf uh, is a useful little utility to just you know, decode the alpha. By the way, if anybody's expecting like bit level format file format descriptions of elf in this talk, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. We don't need to get into that detail. But I'm like, what's there? Dash s will list just list the sections capital S, and um, let's do it like that. So actually, it's quite a lot here. And it's not super readable, right? Because by default, it decides it wants everything to be limited to 80 columns, um, just in case we're going to print it out on a teletype thingy, I guess. So uh, let's do uh, capital W, which then lets it print wide um, and much more readable. Right. So let's look at what, what have we got here. So we've got this dot into, oh, by the way, all these sections start with dot. That's just convention. You don't have to start section names with dot. By convention, what it means is it's a system section. So you can create your own sections. If you want to start making linker scripts and all the rest of it, you can have your own sections. You can start your own sections with dot if you want. But I think the idea is you, um, you shouldn't. So it's kind of like the underscore prefix uh, in the C standard. And so we've got this, 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 this first one here is this interpreter. That tells, that's, that tells the system how to, um, uh, how to load and link the program. We'll take a bit more of a look at that if we get a chance. But let's look at the, and then there's all this stuff. I'm not going to go through them one by one because that would be like the whole session. Um, but if we look here is the text. And it's prog bits, so that means it's sort of making up part of the program. We've got this key here, A, it's, it's to find down the bottom what these things mean. So A is alloc and X is execute. So the text section, what that means is that text, that section needs to be allocated, mapped into the running program. A map needs to be created for it. And that map needs to have, it has read by kind of, everything has read by um, implication and it needs to have executable permissions for fairly obvious reasons. And here we have uh, the, uh, the offset inside that a.out file where the text starts. Um, and, uh, and here we have like the, the, the size of it, right? So, so if I look now at, what was the um, uh, P 
PID is that. So now let's look at what that looks like mapped in. Uh, so here we can see, here's, here's what I, just what I said, right? So we've M mapped in different sections out of the A dot out. Um, and this one I'm going to take a guess is the, is the text, right? Because it's read and execute permissions. And yeah, and if I look, that's the offset, right? So when I look at maps, proc maps, this is the offset that was passed to mmap, the offset into the file that has been mapped, OX1000. And uh, if we look up here, we see, can see the text, as we said, was offset 1060. So the offset is mapped obviously has to be page aligned. And um, uh, so it's sort of just 60 bytes from within and that, pay, that, that way that's been page aligned. I'm not obviously not gonna do this for all of, the, all of the different maps. We can see we've got some read-only maps here and this is gonna be the read-write initial, non-zero initialized data. Um, cool, all right, that's, that's that. So, um, but it's good. well, let's look a little bit more detail now. Um, so, we have some relocation information. Now this all depends on, uh, the defaults depend on like whether you're position independent code, whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit, statically linked, da, da, da. Um, mostly these are dynamic, right? Mostly what's in the file is just offsets from the beginning of maps and then when the program starts, that interp section tells us what, tells us what uh, to run. So if I go, uh, oh, I can't remember. I've got my read off command. There is. I want to look at the uh, the section content. So I want to look at. Oh, did figure this out. Just, uh, maybe dash p will do what I want. Read out stuff dash p. No, it doesn't like that. There's a way to, anyway, if I dump this out, oh, maybe I'll get to it. It, uh, it will tell me that it's almost certainly going to be um, uh, libldlinux.so, which is the uh, loader. And uh, that will then figure out how to relocate all of those symbols. So let me show you a bit more what we mean uh, by that. So my, I've got another program here, just references a global variable, just to show you how this stuff works. Uh, so if I uh, in a not if I just compile it like normally, and uh, I use obstump to disassemble that, and I look at main, look for main. Uh, here we are. Uh, so it's uh, I can see it's this it's this RIP relative. It's position independent, right? So that's where it's loading this global I. And it's writ relative, so it doesn't matter where the, the the kernel decides to mmap the text section, as long as it puts the uh, the read the global data section, the dot data section, a certain bit away from the uh, the fixed offset from the text, then it's all going to be fine. But it probably doesn't want to be constricted like that. So so this tells us that this is. Uh, 4,014 4, or OX2EDD bytes uh, down f ahead of the, the, the instruction pointer. That's where that um, lives. If I load that up into GDB, um, we'll see that it, actually it hasn't relocated, it's not had to relocate anything at all. That's exactly the same as it, that's what it is in memory. It's the same as it is uh, on disk. If I, uh, but if I do this now with 32-bit um, uh, uh, hang on, it's, if, I do, if I do static 32-bit and now do the same, Um, it is, okay, so it's, it's got, it's doing this, so 32-bit 
on x86 doesn't let you do position independent code very conveniently. You can't be, you can't load data relative to the uh, instruction pointer to the pro to the program counter. So it has to do this thunk thing, this dummy call, to get the value of the uh, program counter, which is into uh, uh, EAX in this case. That's going to return the. So it's just really nasty way to get the program counter. 32-bit x86 wants to kind of hide it from you. And then it can reference it by this offset in order to get that kind of... Um, so that's what it does by default. But if I go minus F no pick, these defaults have changed over the years. So for those of us with a bit more gray hair or a bit less hair, I might remember this, this used to be closer to the default. Um, so if I obstump that, Um, it's now, it's got this kind of, uh, this fixed address. It's, the linker has decided what address that's going to live at. Um, and so when it actually loads it up, in, if, I, if I run that in GDB, the, uh, the loader will have, um, will have obliged. There it is, the same, uh, the same address. Uh, but if I don't do it with static, I think we can ignore that warning. Okay, so now it's saying it's going to live at this address, 400C, which mm, the system probably could could probably put a map there, but that feels a bit low. Um, we don't usually see pointers with such a uh, small number of digits. If I run that, now we see it's got this different address, right? So the point the program was started, ldlinux.so uh, will have gone and patched up pointers appropriately for what's in the relocation table. So nothing to do with debugging at this point, right? So this stuff, a lot of this, this stuff just has to exist, whether I've compiled with dash G or not. A lot of this stuff has to exist. Um, there's relocations for the program linkage table, so that's the way that um, dynamic shared objects get mapped with the kind of lazy binding. Um, and there's this global offset table, which is kind of another way of doing, another way of... Um, and dealing with this uh, difficulty of doing a position-independent code, and you could just reference all the globals by, by some table. They all have just sort of slightly different trade-offs, and the compiler will pick whatever defaults. Most of the time, we don't care like which ones to pick, but we do kind of want to know, you know, that for those times when you're staring at assembly code or something, trying to work out what's going on, it's good to know how all this stuff actually works uh, under the hood. Let's look at now. I'm going to look at uh, Adra two line which is possibly like the smallest debugger-like thing. It does kind of what you'd expect, right? It takes an address and, uh, and gives you a line number. But you have to know um, a fair bit uh, of like what's um, where this, you have to figure out where the stuff has been mapped. So if I run Adra2 line and I just give it the, um, the binary, it actually, um, I forgot that right. Yeah. So dash e for the executable. It just actually sits there and waits for me to like type addresses at it in hex, and it will tell me um, kind of where they map to. So if I run this, I just want to find out what the program counter is of main when I'm actually running uh, the program here. Um, so that's my that's my program counter. So I'm in, now that's going to be relative, I need to work that out relative to the start of the text section where that's been mapped. Uh, so let's look uh, info proc maps. Uh, so that's my text section. So okay, so it's been mapped there. Um, um, so that is the offset OX190, uh, except that's probably not going to quite do what I want, right? So if I ask, this is all in hex, if I ask for the uh, line number 190, it doesn't seem to be very useful. And the reason for that is when I look at read elf, uh, we can see that the text section, it's, just, it's, it's because it, it wants to kind of pack everything nice and small, and it wants to kind of, um, but it needs to page align things. So it's going to map it at uh, OX60, um, that's where it lives kind of within the binary, another 60 bytes in from that page. So I need to take another 60 
off that. Nap. No, got that wrong. Do I have to do that? Uh, no, not obviously not that. Okay, that's. We'll come back to that. If I can get that. Did have this working before. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, by I'll have to think about that a bit harder. But the point is just to, just to illustrate how it's all a bit confusing. But uh, you, yeah, you need to kind of work out where the thing is mapped relative to the start of the map and everything else. Um, but address two line could be quite useful if you know you want your you want to, you need for some reason you find yourself needing to um, uh, I don't know you install a segv handler and you want to say this is the line number that segved in my crash message and I can use Adra to line to look that up. Um, okay, yeah, um, BSS. So, uh, so in my program, I've got in my read else output, we've got this BSS section here. Probably most people know about this, right? It's the only one. It's the only one of these sections that has type no bits. Right, because it's the zero initialized data, um, and uh, the system guarantees Unix Linux will guarantee that when you M map some memory, if you don't give it a file backing, then whenever that map gets touched, the physical memory will be allocated at, only at that point, and it will be zeroed. Right, it will be always be contained just zeros when you get it back. So we don't need to store lots and lots of zeros. We can just have just a size basically. Um, BSS, uh, it uh, stands for block started by symbol. Again, I don't know why. I don't know what that means. I can't find, I've done a fair bit of Googling. Anybody know like what that means? No, but anyway, that's what it stands for. Um, just is, uh, and as I said, it has this, this, no, bits, um, this no bits type. Um, I, want, I was curious to try and see what, Okay, so if I've got if I've got read write data, sorry, if I've got read only data, that goes in my .ro data section, which is mapped read only. And if I've got BSS zero initialized data, that goes in the BSS. What happens if I have zero initialized read only data? Where does that go? Anyone want to guess? I, I, I was sort of thinking it might come in its own section, but it seems not. Uh, so, um, what did I have? I put it here as, uh, uh, yeah, okay, here. Um, so, this does what you would, what, what you'd think, right? So, this is some, this is going to, this, this hello string is going to go in our row data. And so, if I try and, I have to cast it here because otherwise the compiler will say you can't write to it. But if I cast it to a char star and write to it, that is going to, I think, False, because it's read-only. Yeah, right, as we would expect. Um, bring that slide to the right. So what happens if I make const uh, int zero? Like where, where is, uh, let's just like allocate a load of bytes there. Where is that going to live? Because that shouldn't. I mean, that's, so that's 128 mega ints of, uh, so what's that, a gig? So actually, let's make it, let's make it exactly a gig. Uh, and it'd uh, be interesting to see where that goes. That's taking a long time to compile a few lines of code, isn't it? And sure enough, it's like it. So it looks like it decides uh, decides to, uh, it decides the read onlyness is more important than the zeroness. Um, not, I think, what I would have decided, but maybe there's some reason why it has to. Usually there is some mad thing in the standard, isn't there? That says that it has to do it like that. Of course, if you really wanted to do that, like, why, why would you do, I mean, why would you ever write that rather than just mmap? I think that's the real, that's the real answer, isn't it? If you want a large zero initialized, um, can't say to just mmap it with the permissions that you want. Okay, um, 
let's get on to uh, the debug info like itself. So it's it's not free. I mean, it, I think it's an important point. This is this isn't a lot of people don't kind of trust this. Dash dash G won't impact generated code at all, right? That's dash big O for different optimization levels. Dash O G is a useful optimization level if you want to make the code kind of vaguely debuggable. So you kind of might as well always compile with dash G, right? Because um, it's just like useful if you get core files or something, you know, you don't you never, no one expects getting core files, but sometimes we do. And so we'll be, we'll regret it if we didn't compile with dash G. Um, uh, it doesn't even, so it doesn't generate, doesn't affect generated code. Doesn't, it doesn't affect the, the runtime memory footprint of your program either, because that debug info, if I go back, here, that debug info does not get mapped into here, right? It stays on the disk. So it's kind of, well, okay, it's not entirely true. There is some extra relocation type stuff that might get mapped, but that's really, I can't imagine a world in which that would be uh, material. So we might as well just compile with dash G, um, except it does increase the size of the binaries a lot sometimes, particularly if you've got lots of C++ with templates and all that kind of stuff. I mean, templates are very good at, uh, uh, you know, compiling down to very little code, but the debugger needs to go in the other way, right? So <laughs> what you've magicked away in your very clever template stuff needs to, we need all the stuff in the dwarf to like unmagic it back again. Um, uh, uh, and so that can be, that can be a problem. Um, uh, and it can increase your, it can significantly increase your link times. Um, because the, if, I, if, if my debug info is in all of my .o files, and I have hundreds of .o files, and then when I link them together, I need to generate the executable that contains all of the debug info, but lots of relocation stuff, you know, addresses where things live needs, and offsets, things have needs to move around based on what the linker does. So it needs to recompute all of this debug info. And if I'm doing, you know, I change like one .c file and remake, and I just have one C file to compile to my object file, but then I need to link everything and it needs to do with all this, you know, huge amounts of debug info, it can start to become a real pain. So let's look at this in practical terms. Uh, so I've got here, I've just taken a random, real, but manageable size program, gzip. And uh, if I go um, C flags equals dash G, so let's go dash G. Well, actually, let's, let's not do that for now. Um, configure and make, so, the configure actually takes longer to run than the make. And so let's have a look at that. Okay, so that's 116K. Uh, let's do C flags equals dash G. Let's do dash G3. You know, dash G3 gives just better uh, debug info, but you know, more, right? Um, so it allows the debugger to see more stuff. Um, rebuild that. So it was 116K. And now it's like, you know, what, three times bigger. Um, and uh, uh, that can be annoying if you've got a big program. If you, I think Firefox, if compiled with debug info, is about nine, the resulting binary is about 90% debug info. Um, so you know it can be it can be pretty significant. Um, uh, okay, doesn't matter. right. So uh, da, da, da. yeah, so that's so that's maybe a reason not to do dash g by default because it just takes ages and they're really big. Um, so that's where split dwarf comes in. So split dwarf just it takes what it can out of the .o file. Some, some debug information remains in the .o file, but the bulk of it goes out into this new thing called D, dot .dwi, dwo, which is a separate uh, debug info, which is a separate file with the debug info. So if I go 
dash G split. Dwarf, by the way, stands for debugging with attributes and so it's very weak um, acronym, uh, did a sort of pun on elf anyway. Um, sometimes programmers aren't as funny as they think they are. Uh, so now, it's a bit bigger, so it was 116K with no debug info, but it's a lot smaller than the 360 odd K. And, um, and importantly, that link stage is going to be much quicker if I just rebuild having touched one, uh, having touched one file. And I have lots and lots uh, of these DWO files, right? This contains all, all the debug info for those compilation units. Um, <coughs> So let's have a look. So let's go, go back to my uh, hello program because it's nice and small. So let's have a look in that. It's, 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 you can use, you can use, we'll get onto this in a bit. You can use read elf or objump or there's, an, there's also dwarf dump um, and uh, uh, that just basically gives a nice kind of human readable-ish version of, uh, of all the debug information, right? Um, and so we have uh, uh, these, these different um, sort of broken down into these compilation units and then they, the dwarf info itself is kind of this tree structure, right? And a node on the trees can have tags and um, they can have attributes and they can have other, they're called, a, each of these nodes is called a die debug information entry, I think, and dies can contain dies or references to dies, right? So, you know, that's how structs work. Um, and uh, here I can see, look, we've got like this defi definition of what a long, ein long unsigned int is and a char, and it's only a very simple hello world program, so there's really not a lot here. Um, here's I've got at the top, it gives me some sort of, okay, how it was compiled, because that might be interesting. Oh, this is my read-only program, not even, um, not even hello world. Um, and uh, kind of the range where program counters might be, and then it gets into more detail for, actually most of what's in, uh, sorry, the CU, so this is the compilation unit, uh, it's gonna be ro.c and it's got this main function and that's about it. Most of what goes in the debug info is type info, actually the mapping of, um, just in terms of like, you know, the complexity and the bytes and everything, the mapping of program counters to file names in, in, in line numbers in files is not that hard. Um, um, but we can see the kind of the kind of stuff we've got in there. Uh, if I've got all these DWO files, then I can have my DWP, which obviously if you ask Google what that stands for, it will tell you it's the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, but it's the dwarf package. Um, so I can take all my DWO files and kind of tar them up, right? But it's better, that it's different from tar because each of these, like remember, everything is an ELF file, right? So each of these DWO files is an ELF file, and it contains these sections. And then when you run it through the DWP tool, it will tar up, join up all these DWOs, and, but not have, like, but merge all the sections together, right? And so it has a relatively small number of sections in the DWP uh, file. At least that's the theory. Um, so then what you're supposed to be able to do, if I go back to my, gzip that I made. So the way you run this, and I've checked, and I think this is right, uh, is you just do DWP, you give it the binary number, and in the binary name will be all the references to the DWO files that needs to go and slurp in. So if you run that, okay, so that obviously isn't great. I mean, um, yeah, I can't get this to work. It's probably just the DWP that's, that's comes with my distro. I, I guess I didn't quite have time to download it all from source, but I've Googled and other people do have this problem. So it's, if you encounter that, it's not just you. Uh, but yeah, in theory, very useful. So now if you do this, it does actually, I think, make more sense to just compile with dash G all the time, because you'll, you'll, um, uh, uh, you don't have that horror of looking at the core file or whatever without knowing what you're doing. Um, so yeah, maybe you'll fare better than me. Um, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, I've, Docker makes me sad, right, and containers in general. It's like, it's basically dynamic shared objects don't work, seems to be the uh, conclusion that we've reached. Um, uh, and I think this is why, um, but this is one reason why the, the, how big things are on disk really matters, right? If I'm spinning up containers all the time and 90% and of it is debug info, that can start to get painful. A bit of a tangent, um, debug symbols or debug info? Or are they different? What do we think? Don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why this annoys me or bothers me or why I care, but I can't help, can't help it. Um, I think debug symbols is a Windows term and debug info is the Unix term, but uh, debug symbol seems to just be so stuck in everyone's mind, people start referring to it. They basically mean kind of the same thing if it means anything at all. Interestingly, that's what I, th and I was kind of pretty confident with that. And I thought, well, people say debug symbols doesn't, doesn't really matter, does it? Um, GDB calls them debug symbols as well. I think it should be debug info. Uh, yeah, right, so many utilities to read ELF files. Uh, so read ELF and obstump, which have a lot of kind of, a lot of stuff that you can do in either, and you just kind of doesn't really seem to matter whether you use obstump or read ELF. Um, and then there's these other versions, EU read ELF and EU obstump, which I thought, I'm pretty sure it hasn't got anything to do with the European Union, so I thought that must have been named by an American. Turns out it wasn't, it was Ulrich Drepper, but anyway. Um, elf utils, that's what that EU stands for. So this is read elf just for elf utils because read elf will read all kinds of binary formats, not just elf. Uh, and uh, a dwarf dump we looked at, yeah, so ReadElf and Obstump, well, they use this layer called BFD, right, which is this kind of binary compatibility kind of shim kind of layer that allows these tools to uh, read all kind of different formats because, like, maybe it's actually 1985 and we need to, you know, read something that's in, um, what were these? Stabs. Yes, yeah, and what was, and cough and all that stuff, right? Maybe this. Uh, and what? N magic. N magic. Oh, not heard of that one. That's a new one. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. Uh, oh, an A dot out format. That was a different format, right? Even though it's called A dot out. A dot out format just relatively recently got removed from the kernel, from the Linux kernel. They, they, that went a year or two ago, but it's still called A dot out. Good, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, BFD. So what does so there's this thing libbfd which lets it which lets read elf read things that aren't elf. Uh, anyone know what BFD stands for? I'm very childish. So this one amuses me more than the dwarf thing. So uh, officially, it stands for binary file description. Right. I mean, it doesn't tell you anything at all, does it? So called because there was an argument on a mailing list some decades ago between somebody and Richard Stallman. And Stallman said that he shouldn't do this because it would be really complicated and it'd be a nightmare. And he responded that it didn't seem like any big fucking deal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why BFD is called BFD. Anyway, unfortunately, sadly, that's all kind of, I think, going away because everything's just elf now. So it's kind of become... Uh, redundant. So EU read elf and EU obstump are allegedly, I haven't verified this, but allegedly a lot faster than read elf and obstump. And uh, the claim is claimed less buggy. Uh, maybe there's an EU DWP that would work. <laughs> All right. Um, that's enough of that. Right. Debug info D. It's pretty cool. So I think uh, one of the 
places, I think, that you, one could reasonably argue, actually, there's a lot of ways you could argue that the Microsoft debug ecosystem is just richer than, than what we've had in the Linux world. It's you know, had many more millions of dollars of investment and uh, they've got all this stuff. One of the things, but I think partly also th this difference, I think partly sort of a cultural thing. So um, like forever, Microsoft has this idea, this Microsoft symbol server. So you can run this symbol server on your network. You can run your programs that are all stripped or whatever you call that on Windows. And then when you want to debug them or load a core file, whatever you call that on Windows, uh, it, the, the, the debugger, will, if there's a symbol server, it can talk to the symbol server and map everything and everything works nicely. I think it's partly because, yeah, philosophically, Linux is more kind of open source and you're supposed to have the source code there and you're supposed to be building everything from source anyway, so like, what's the big deal? Um, I mean, I, I deal, uh, well, I spend a lot of time dealing with large, uh, uh, very large engineering departments of like big tech firms, right? Thousands and thousands of people in them. And they've got this, you know, this, just all of them is over the years have just grown all this huge complexity in their build system. No one knows how the build systems work. No one knows where, and then their bits, you know, these bits get built and then they get combined with these other bits that get built in a completely different way. And some of them have debug info and some of them don't. And some, it's a real pain. And it kind of means they spend a lot more time, I think, using printf debugging than they should. Um, because just the, just, yeah, just, the, just the pain of getting the, finding out where the debug info lives for the particular thing you're trying to debug. Um, so uh, good people at Red Hat in the last two or three years have made this thing, debug info D, which is pretty simple. I think it's like, someone told me it's 1,500 or 2,000 lines of code or something, but it's pretty, it's pretty awesome what you can do in a small amount of code these days. Um, and uh, that will essentially do the same job as Microsoft Symbol Server. So it will, uh, it will sit on a server somewhere and hand out the debug info. And it does, and it can do that because for the longest time, a long, a long time now, we've had, um, if I go back to my favorite utility, Redelf, or let's do EU Redelf for fun, uh, dash N will give me the notes section. So remember, remember we've got these, all these sections, we're not going to look at all of them, as I said, but, but we've, some of these sections are of type note. And um, they just sort of tell you stuff uh, about, about the binary. Um, so if I look at dash N, um, so we've got these three notes section in that file, and um, section two, three, and four. And I've got this sort of property that tells me like what it is. It's this x86 thing. and something about the stack, can't remember what that means, but uh, stuff down here on the ABI. So this is compiled to run on Linux. So this, this assumes that there's a Linux 3.2 kernel uh, or newer. Um, uh, and then it's got this thing, this build ID, which is this unique ID. Uh, well, it's unique and it's, it will, it, the idea of this, this, this SHA hash thing is it's a, it's a hash of the build, such that if you have repeatable builds, these will come and you build the same thing, repeat these, this should come out the same. So this is repeatable, but unique, if you follow me. And so debug info D can use this and talk to GDB and other things and, uh, and, and, and use this build ID to make sure it gives you the debug info that matches the thing that you're trying to debug, which is kind of handy. And it's quite easy to use. So uh, if I... Um, so let's, so gcc minus g, hello.c, let's, uh, let's just copy a dot out into temp, and now let's strip a dot out. And so now if I run gdb, obviously, on a dot out, no debugging symbols found, as we've already seen. But if I, somewhere else I run uh, debug info D, and I can just go, oh, sorry, let me go into temp. Uh, debug info D, and uh, I just said it, look at the file system from the current directory and just recurse through and find all the debug info type things it can find. Um, and it will run that server by default on port 8002. So now if I go debug info D URLs equals localhost 8002 GDB, out. 
It says, do you want to enable debug info D? Yes, please, because otherwise I wouldn't have asked it. And, uh, and voila, and there we are, and it works. So that's quite cool. It will also serve the source code as well. Um, and all the distros now have debug info D servers uh, running, and it's all kind of um, federated. So you, or, or is federated the right word? So it's sort of tree thing. So you can have your local debug info D, and if it doesn't find the match there, it will then go up the tree to Ubuntu or whatever. Um, and uh, you get all the debug info, debugging goodness as you step through libc. Uh, it's not just uh, it's not just GDB. Um, Valgrind system tap, uh, as said before, various various things uh, are, will pretty much. I think any any major tool that wants to speak debug info will speak debug info D. Uh, any questions or anyone want to anyone using debug info D? No, no one's using it. <coughs> Had you heard of it? Okay, right, well that's why you're not using it, I guess. Now maybe you will. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. Let's. Uh, well, I installed it by going uh, sudo apt install debug info D. It's, it's packaged with. Um, most most distros of it. Yeah, it's it's new, but not, but but old enough that it's just kind of you know, there. Uh, yes, question. Uh, so the question is: Are there are there private companies out there who have debug info D servers that you could kind of? Uh, not that I know of. Um, but I haven't looked, I must admit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, question here. Uh, Tom, is there a technical question? Uh, at the start, you mentioned that if you're referring to have symbols in it. Yes. Uh, then you strip your executable and it has no symbols. Yeah. I built a linker myself and it didn't include a symbol table, and all tools are fine with it except for GDB. <laughs> because you said you have to have a symbol table. I happen to know why that is. I do not know why that is. Uh, didn't even know that was the case. Um, yeah, so uh, but I think it might I mean, could it be that just GDB is giving you a really confusing message about deep about debug symbols when it's actually looking for debug info? It says what? Really? There you go. That sounds like a bug in GDB then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just if an LDB will do it. That's that's clearly, yeah, just um, yeah. Well, that's the reward you get for making your own linker. <laughs> I think I saw I thought I saw one more hand up, but no. Okay, let's uh, let's then let's we're kind of racing through this quite quickly. So I think we're going to finish early, but I'm sure um, no one will be too upset having a bit more time back. Um. Let's talk about backtraces. Uh, so um, back in the day, you'll notice this is 32-bit x86 code. Uh, functions mostly started and ended like this, right? So pr push the frame pointer, uh, uh, then clobber the frame pointer with the current stack pointer, use that as your new frame, and then when you reverse that when you return. Okay, so we've got a base pointer. And a stack pointer, x86 is descending stack, so as we push things, stack pointer gets smaller. Um, and, uh, and, and the base pointer is kind of where our stack frame starts. And this will move up and down as our, as our function is just executing and doing its thing and calling other functions and all the rest of it. Um, so we push the stack point, so we push the, uh, the previous uh, base pointer onto the stack. And now stack pointer and base pointer are the same. And now the function starts doing things and stack, and, and we get this linked list of return addresses, right? So it's really simple on old school 32-bit x86 code to do a backtrace, because you just take the base pointer and you follow the linked list and it gives you the return addresses. Uh, uh, but this was um, kind of inefficient because, I mean, especially on 32-bit x86, registers are a scarce resource and we're burning a register for the frame pointer. And uh, so people would often build with 
um, FMIT frame pointer, because the compiler knows all this stuff, right? The compiler, it's really kind of, there's no need to be pushed to be burning this base pointer because the compiler has to know at any, for any program counter, like what is the offset for that program counter of the stack pointer to the current stack frame. Well, the compiler kind of has to know where the stack pointer is, otherwise nothing's going to work, right? Um, so yeah, why, why, and so if we can just make our tools smart enough, then um, there's just no need to be burning a register like this. Um, so the compiler has these CFI, sometimes called call frame information, but actually call frame instructions, pedantically, um, that are, these are instructions that the, comp or, uh, what do you call them, directives, I think, that the compiler emits when it generates the source code. Um, so if we, do I have this? I don't think, no, no. So let's have a, so if we, here is, uh, here's a thing that calls some functions and uh, it's dash s, isn't it, to get it just to give me the assemble out, assembly output. Um, I don't think I need the dash g, but just, and that gives me foobar.s, I think. Yeah, so, and I should see, here we are, look. So it's telling me that the, this tell this directive tells that tells us that the uh, the base pointer the frame address is uh, one of the one of these numbers refers to the register that it's indirecting off so it's going to be at, at RSP and then uh, the other number is a number of uh, bytes or words that it is anyway it gives you the inf so so if you if you can talk this and this CFI information then that pops out in read elf ws oh actually it's uh like that and then that pops out in here this eh frame exception handling frame so it's called except so it's used for um yeah, used by C++ and, and, and other um, except, compiled exception, compiled languages with exceptions in order to unwind um, as, a, as a minimum. But it's also used to um, just walk the stack, give you a backtrace, even if you don't have the frame, the frame pointer. Um, uh, oh, there's also a deep, sorry, I didn't know this. And there's also a debug frame. Is there? No, that's not here. Okay, I don't know why that isn't. There. Anyway, yeah. Um, okay, that's why I remember now. Yeah. So, um, and this stuff is yeah. This stuff is man. This is quite useful. So this stuff is mandatory. I mean, I don't know what happens if you don't do it. I don't think you get like arrested or anything. But uh, but but the x eighty six sixty four ABI mandates that this uh, uh, this frame information, this EH frame information is there in all of the binaries. Which means I can do things like strace dash k date. And so dash k with strace will give you the backtrace. Um, it doesn't know much about what these functions are in date because like that's just the date that ships in my system and it doesn't have any debug info. Um, but at least it can walk the stack. And if there are exported functions, uh, it can it can know about them. So if I go strace dash k on a dot out, which is this thing with foo that calls bar, we should see, yeah, there we are, look. There's main calling foo, calling bar, calling printf and stuff. Well, actually, it doesn't call printf, it calls put s. So if you do printf and you don't, and you just have a string, a literal string, the compiler will just optimize that by saying, putting um, by calling put s instead, and then you can you can see the stack trace. Um, so that's kind of handy for you know all kinds of tools, profiling and other things. Uh, okay, you can if you really want. You can tell the compiler not to do that. 